Okay, can you all hear me, everyone? Excellent. Okay, so welcome and thank you for all coming. And it's great to see how how many people are keen to keep learning and keep keep understanding a bit more deeper picture in terms of where we're at and things like that. So okay, so let's get on the way. So as I mentioned, not a lawyer. Uh, or financial advisor, not licensed in any way, shape or form. So don't give up your power to me or anyone else. So really it's just my way of like, like I said, teaching, serving, giving back where I can. And really like everyone else, just making the best of, of the current world situation, what's going on and playing my part and where possible seeking to take a balanced view as to what we're seeing so we can come through this out the other side unscathed. So let's, just basically get rid of all distractions. Top questions in the chat. Uh, last week, everyone was great. Really respectful, which I appreciate. Um, you all know, but I've had a few people laugh when I just kick people off. And that's just because, yeah, there's many good people on here. Many, many people keen to learn and make a difference and find their path in it all. So it just spoils it for everyone else when you've got people being a smart ass or just putting comments saying, I'm not learning anything. You just, if you're not learning anything, then by all means, go, you know, leave. Um, there's other places you can go to. So there'll be a recording. Um, most of it, I anticipate recording today. Like anything, sometimes when I go into certain things, I do shut it off for a brief period of time, up to two hours and no selling on, on the webinar. So what am I coming today? So it's part three of a four part series. So as you know, the last two weeks I've focused on lawful rights. I've taken a little bit of an intermission in this part three, just to focus on understanding the realities and the truth of history, so to speak. So understanding history, understanding where we've come from um, before next week, we go into a financial reset teaching and how the financial resets work and how, if we think what's going on right now is bad enough, wait till you see the economic financial collapse, which has been meticulously planned as well as this current, um, pandemic or whatever it is you want to call it. And then I probably will do a week five, um, simply because it does be a conclusion and summary of everything at this stage. One little aside, some exciting news. I, Some of you who have been involved in energy clearing as an aside, I've got Raymond Grace to agree next week, straight after our webinar, to actually do a class with me where we're going to do a bit of an interview just to update on energy shifting, what's happening around the world and other parts. And getting Raymond's always a gift, as those of you know. So what will be happening next week is I know we normally start 5.30 or 7.30. We'll be starting half an hour early next week just because Raymond can't start later than 7 o'clock. So to make sure we've got enough time to get through this. So that's just a bit of an update. So anyway, that's my kombucha, by the way. So don't worry, I'm not getting drunk on the webinar or anything like that. Um, so while we're in the middle of a civilization collapse and how it's been predicted for quite some time, um, the history of collapses, I'm gonna go through a few samples um, and show why they collapse and why we're pretty much following the blueprint quite beautifully for a civilization collapse. Spiritual awakenings in history um, and how really, why you have to have a side-by-side -side spiritual and political awakening. As an aside, societies that have great spiritual or religious awakenings, but without political, usually end up with persecutions and um, all kinds of problems in society. And societies that attempt to do political revolutions about spiritual end up in an absolute diabolical mess and normally end up with people ending up on guillotines and all kinds of stuff. And you're seeing that happen a little bit in the woke revolution in the US right now, where some of, the, some of the things that are being called racist or being called whatever else is just mind boggling. So you'll be seeing what a true revolution really is or awakening, which will involve a mixture of spiritual, political, and really economic as well, because all three areas have to be covered. Why I believe it'll get worse before it gets better, but also why I believe it'll get a lot better than people are probably thinking right now. So, and, from there, why we'll see one of the greatest awakenings in modern history 
the future for the West and what we can do to protect our interests. So this is just one of these things, understanding the truth. And just on the side, I remember in 2015, I was doing webinars on civilization collapses and what was going to happen in the world. And I remember getting numbers was very, very, very difficult. Most people didn't really want to hear what I was saying at the time with a guy called Stephen Pettit, who a few of you know, because it's like, well, how can that happen? You know, the world's going pretty well financially and, you know, we're in a great time of history. And yeah, now people are listening a little bit more. And many economic experts and what's called political experts and what's called cultural or demographic um, social, um, what's called social um, research um, experts on societal and demographics have been predicting this fairly major collapse, so to speak. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Love you, man. You're very kind. I love you too, my friend. So Barbara's feeling despondent. Look forward to the hope. Well, sometimes, Barb, what you hear isn't always what you want to hear, but knowing the ugly truth and then seeing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and sort of oncoming train can leave you in a good state. And that's how I see this, that the end result's going to be fantastic, but you're just going to have to be a little bit patient in the meantime. So understanding that we're heading into socialism and a civilization collapse. And it's interesting to watch what's going on right now in Australia and the war mentally on, on, on to push a socialist path. <clears throat> Watching, for example, the pressure on the Liberal Party and Scott Morrison to, to give funding to New South Wales disaster payments. And Seeing, for example, what's happening in the US where they're just printing money like it's toilet paper. Um, probably not a good example because who knows we've had, but printing money like it's just water and giving it away en masse. And US is already heading into a form of hyperinflation. And I'll go more into that shortly. And Australia has resisted that so far. Um, but, and I have to give, you know, Scott Morrison one thing. Um, he may have botched up a few things to do with the pandemic and be doing some pretty nasty little things that we know about in terms of, but the one thing I reckon he's got right overall is the economic management. It's interesting to see the pressure on him to just start giving money away to various states, which um, in the short term solves an immediate problem that in the long term actually is a greater giving away of rights than you can imagine, because now you're trusting in the government and trusting in socialism to do that. Um, which is, I think we're learning that trusting government to take care of our needs is, well, a dangerous place to be. I, Zena says, I'm really loving what you're teaching. Thank you so much, Zena. Um, very kind. But yeah, so people, um, so yeah, trusting in government, as you can see, I was, even today, I was talking to a friend of mine who's living in Sydney, who's just like, I don't know if there's any Sydneyites here, if you are, just say hi and you know, lots of love to you, if there is. It's certainly gone a bit nuts over there. And my friend who runs a firm over there was just saying to me, like, um, yeah, he's saying that it's just completely crazy at the moment. And he asked me, what do you think of it? Because we hadn't really spoken about it. And I said, well, I said, there's one thing I know um, very well. I said, do you think for one minute that the government cares about my health? And he laughed. He goes, no. So I said, I don't think the government ever cares about my health. So I said, whatever's going on, I think it's safe to say it's not about my health. And so, and he said, I could not agree with you more. And then the conversation went deeper from there. So um, fast turning into socialism and a civilization collapse. So to say that we need a spiritual and political, um, you know, awakening is an understatement. And lots of people from Sydney, so hi and welcome. And hopefully this will give you a semblance of hope. Um, something that my friend said that might help you. And last year in Perth, when we had our lockdown, I just took it as a time out to reflect. Um, this is what my friend's doing. He did say to me, though, he said, I really feel for the people who've got the financial challenges right now. And I think see this lockdown as if there's any silver lining in it over Sydney is it's kind of showing you a taste of what the future society could look like and how vulnerable you are. And so if you haven't taken action, you know, on the financial kind of side of your life or on your understanding of world history, I think the Sydney situation in Melbourne is actually showing you how vulnerable you really are right now. Because effectively, 
the government have, have shut down the city. And as people are realising that it's pretty hard to stop them from doing it. And the protest, you're going against a very strong force, a force which has had a lot of time to prepare and is basically playing pretty dirty, you know, playing, they're not playing fair. And people are trying to play like fairly against an unfair opponent. That's how I'm seeing it, who's cheating on the rules of the game. So understand if I can do this, one can only imagine where this could go bar an awakening in the next few years where you're pretty much blackmailed for your food, your water, your religion, your power, your internet, everything by governments just kind of saying you're going to have to do X, Y and Z and then we'll look after you. So just really important right now to take this time to get empowered because empowerment makes life easier. The reason why I'm overall pretty cool about it is I'm pretty empowered, done my study, spent years, prepared myself and yeah, there's a few things that bother me, but by and large, when something bothers me, I take whatever action I can. <laughs> Sarah says, I don't want this to wear, and really enjoying them. I learned so much and truly appreciate you spending your time. Oh, look, thank you. Yeah, look, it's messages like that that make me want to keep going, just so you know. So, yeah, that's why I enjoy getting on webinars. And as Grace will tell you, who's my business partner and helps me run the, um, the religious work, you know, I can talk all day if you get me going. So... Let's do some revision from last couple of weeks as to what we've covered. So we went through the common law, how it's from the Bible, constitution, and how basically it gives the blessings of Almighty God and really over, over our nation, which has been one of the reasons I personally believe we've been a blessed country by and large. I mentioned how we're a monarchy with this guy running the show, the Governor General um, under the Queen and uh, who in turn has got their various uh, advisors. So I mentioned these two houses of parliament, like you've got the um, lower house, so to speak. And these are the gang that actually make all the laws. And they're the ones who come out and say, hey, you know, um, so unless you're one of these lower houses of parliament, um, you can't basically, um, you know, pass a law. So you have to be a member of the house of representatives, so to speak. So, and then in turn, You've got the upper house, which is um, the Senate, who basically um, controls, um, who basically what's called the accountability group. They're the ones who have to approve the laws. And although they can't write up laws and put up a new bill, they can come up and they can approve laws and or reject the law they don't particularly like. Vanessa, you have a silky smooth listening voice. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to hear. So the let's just quickly get this um, thing up. Yeah, this is what I showed last week. You've got um, the lower house, which passes laws. Okay. And the parliament guys turn up on girls and put some laws in here. They vote in it. This is where governments run from. Whoever has the most politicians in this place wins. So at the moment, it's Liberal with the National Party together, um, plus Craig Kelly making up the 76th number. And this group over here has to approve the law. So even if they pass the laws, if this doesn't do it, and you may remember this group, it's harder to get into. This group, it's much easier to have a very small vote, like as much as only two or 3% of the electorate and get in there. So I always say that anyone who wants to make an economic, a, a political difference, you should always look first at the center. So I mentioned also that this is the um, separation of powers. So the constitution, you've got the parliament who makes the laws, the executive puts into action and implements it, and the judiciary, what a high court makes judgments to say what what these mean when this group and this group are arguing or the people think that this group's going too far. So that's why people go, hey, let's just go and take on um, constitution and we think the state of emergency is crap. If you think that, um, you've got to go um, through the courts and argue the executive government uh, have abused their power. So that's how it works. So let's just now, Going, so that's what we also covered last week. Like, can jabs be made mandatory? Now, this has been the big one where many have held on to and held their hopes in is section um, 109. When a law is consistent with the law of the Commonwealth, the latter shall prevail and the former shall be invalid. And as I mentioned last week, when you actually read that in the court cases, and Malcolm Roberts of One Nation agrees with me, this does not unfortunately help because the Commonwealth doesn't really have power over vaccines the way section 51 reads 
um, I mentioned. So they've got power of a quarantine, but they haven't got much over vaccines. And I think that as a result, it means the states are perfectly entitled to pass laws on vaccines. So Bob says, it seems to me the court influenced by government is says, yeah, well, basically one of the problems is that the constitution was never designed to have like parties like Labour and Liberal. It was meant to have individual reps um, representing their groups. And on top of that, as Charles Finney, who was one of the members of the Great Awakening, which you'll be hearing about today, and that's why I mentioned that a real awakening is political and spiritual. He did a lot of um, messages in his church exposing Freemasonry. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't hear many churches today exposing Freemasonry. And he straight up said this is a wicked, diabolical institution. And he went through and taught the laws and how they subverted the court system and how they control the court system. They control the parliament by getting into the parties and then control the court system. So he exposed Freemasonry heavily, heavily. Um, in his preaching and um interestingly the guy in 1978 the 33-day pope um pope luciani i don't know if anyone's ever read um heard much about that but pope luciani 1978 the 33-day pope who was poisoned um and when you read the story in god's name by david yallop the book about it you just you, you, you cry literally and, you know he was a pope who they didn't quite bargain on who came in and tried to clean up the catholic church a very pure-hearted man and he ordered a, he basically ordered that all Freemasonries to reveal themselves because he's going to kick them all out of the Catholic Church. He, um, as basically Satanists, he ordered that um, anyone who was involved in the mafia, he would order all the church bank accounts everywhere to check where they were funding into the mafia. And, you know, basically, it's quite an amazing book. And then the whole book shows how he was poisoned. So I don't know if anyone here has read that, but it's quite a remarkable story. So generally great leaders that you read about generally expose the fact that a lot of the governments which are meant to work in the best interest of people get taken over by secret interest groups. And some of you have heard like the deep state, for example, that very generic term. But, you know, um, you've got to actually look at, um, you know, the deep state. It's really, it's, it's, it's just basically the secret special interest group or whatever else. So the problem we've got by and large is politicians not re re working in the best interests of the people and more acting in the interest of a special interest group. And then you've got on top of that, um, the politicians doing that, you've got the courts also infiltrated um, and controlled by people from these secret interest groups or whatever else. So, um, yeah, so this is one of the biggest problems we're dealing with is that Knowing your legal rights is a start, but it's a little bit difficult when you can't really use them much because you're being snookered out by a special interest group. So this is why I cannot emphasize enough, you have to have a spiritual awakening to expose these people. Because when, when you have a spiritual awakening, you have the power in your mind and spirit to expose what's going on, and you're not afraid anymore. You move beyond the fear of death. You start to go, you know what? I'll do what's right, regardless if it costs me my life, if it costs me my business, I don't give a cr like absolute crap, you know? I will do whatever it takes. And when, it, when people get to that stage, and generally that doesn't happen until people have a spiritual awakening, because the legal thing, it's one thing to know a whole lot of shit in your head and go, oh man, I've just learned this great cool stuff and I'm gonna go out and serve a common law notice on the cops and on the courts and all that. But that's really just kind of, um, you know, dead foreplay unless you're actually exposing the, the root of the problem and what's, you know, binding the people up and binding up the court system. You know, it's like consistently taking, um, you know, medicines or painkillers rather than getting to the root of the problem in your body to fix it. So that's what we're dealing with right now. That's why you've got to expose what's really going on. You've got these special secret interest groups that are controlling the parliament and the court system. And yeah, they don't like to be exposed and you got to be strong as heck to take it on. I mean, the first time I took it on years ago, didn't go too well for me because I wasn't ready for it. And I went a bit hard at it. I didn't understand the spiritual powers and the dark forces I was dealing with and got taken out quite badly, lost business, lost all kinds of shit. And then I met, Pollock, then I met people who showed me the ways and I learned about how dark energy and Satanism works on a bigger level. And I met people who had been in politics who told me how the system works and bit by bit i managed to 
take some time out, spent many years in the wilderness and thought, well, I'll come back if and when I think I can actually make a stand and, you know, make play my part in the army of God, which seems that that's what's happening right now. So um, anyway, the main thing to realize is that once you realize that, you stop running around and being a banana, you know, and running up and thinking it's some cool thing to go and yelling at a cop, you know, with someone filming you on social media. And ultimately, five years later, we'll be looked back as a little bit of a goose. Um, and by all means, I'm saying sometimes you've got to stand your ground, like when there's blatant brutality, absolutely. You know, I've saw some of the stuff with government, police and authority, and some of that's just like, yeah, no, nah, you've got to, many people did well to stand their ground and bring awareness. So the point is, though, you've got to get to the root of a problem. And that's that's what I really, I'm hoping to today, to people to really see, you've got to get to hit the root of the problem. And that means, yes, know your legal rights, know your political situation, get that clear in your mind, but then from there, be aware of the interest groups that are controlling the situation and realize that that's why any successful society, as I'll show you on the evidence, that gets a reformation, it starts in a spiritual consciousness shift among the people and exposing corruption that's going on where people lose that fear of death and fear of comfort to do what's right by the higher good of their path and purpose. So that's what I see is preparing for in Australia and across the world. And this state of emergency, it's just, um, you know, being so, you know, it's been fairly misused. I'm sure that everyone here would agree with me that, but at the end of the day, it is what it is and it's there right now. And until, people are really willing to understand it, willing to address this and address the special interest groups and do what's right. And when I say do what's right, do what's right with your unique part in the army of God and in the overall thing, that's when we can make a difference. I've said for a long time to people, I do not believe for a minute the elite fear a million people protesting in London. Even though it's great, I think the elite greatly fear 300 people who are willing to, to die for their cause, spiritually, financially, even physically, if it comes to that, um, to do what's right. And that's what's changed history many, many times. So we went through mandates versus legislation and how most of this, that's really what you're dealing with here. You know, mandates, um, lockdowns, workplace, kids in school, childcare, um some things there's ways around the law some things just have to say i'm not conforming like there's no way in heck i would have ever made my kids wear masks in school if i had to go there i wouldn't care what the law said i would have just ignored that you know straight out that's just nuts um so yeah all this kind of stuff so we also uh, went to the overarching human right and this by the way notice again the spiritual in every underground movement teaching i did it's understanding your sovereignty, uh, man, woman, sovereign under God. And yeah, so there has to be a spiritual awakening to realize that. Like going along to a seminar and hearing about sort of stuff, if you don't have a direct understanding or connection with God, however that happens to look for you, um, some people get it through Tao, some people get it through a very structured spirituality. I get mine through a very strong Christian background, but you know, bringing in a lot of the Tao, the um, deeper teachings of the Hindu, the sacred scrolls, the, you know, universal energy, and bring that all together to understand the broader, broader picture. So whatever your structure happens to be, having a structure, a connection with God that gives you, or, or source, that gives you the strength for the set of values and principles and standards. And most religions, when you study them, have got a lot of common ground when it comes to this. They've actually got a lot of common ground and it's quite kind of quite interesting how so many of them are arguing on the war of each other when really when you study a lot of it a lot of this stuff isn't that far different so the important thing is that the overarching human right comes from here it comes from the inalienable right to life liberty property the inalienable right for laws not to be out of out of balance like a law for example that says you have to have um something falls into your body is just obviously a violation, you know, of, of a high law. It's just like a, a, a mandate that says you have to dob your neighbor in or you have to kill your children if you've got more than one. I mean, these are fairly blatant and fairly obvious ones. But hopefully 
you'll get the drift of what I'm saying. So these are all spiritual understandings and mindsets and mental belief patterning that you get the more you go on this path and study it. And we really are at war, you know. Our, and I've heard people say this scripture, this passage, for our battle is not flesh and blood, but think about it. So really it means our fight is not against the governments, although obviously they're a physical representation. It's the spiritual powers and the dark energies that are behind, you know, that are behind the dark forces or whatever. It's that are behind the governments. And I found that that's where Raymond Grace next week, for those of you who after the webinar feel like coming along to that, Raymond's seen incredible results and helped me. And we've, we've seen some pretty interesting results in Perth. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been coming along to our energy clearing webinar for City Awakening, but we've seen some pretty interesting results, which has happened so frequently now that we've pretty much concluded there's no coincidence. So no doubt that our struggle is not flesh and blood. Who's, who's been coming to some of those um, webinars out of interest? Just type, I'm just curious if anyone here has been coming to it. So, let's see, yeah. For some reason I can't get this up. Oh, yeah. Okay, Sydney came this Sunday. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, great. Well, thank you, everyone. So, it's been a few. So, yeah, I have them sporadically on our City Awakening group. I just announced them from time to time. We do have our Sunday webinars that are a bit of frequently weekly, but we do have, um, you know, young, also, we do have like sporadic, like random ones from time to time. Um, so, questions that are being asked here on legal stuff, feel free to ask them when we come to the end you know just keep them and remind them so and i'm happy to do that the um, only one that i'll mention seeing as it comes up here um about the overarching human right someone said about section 5123a and whether that actually applies well people have different opinions i have my strong reservations because um, i shared a miss last week so i recommend tony that you go and watch the last week's one because it's it doesn't, um, Nathan Buckley is arguing that, but I think just about every other lawyer or person that I've spoken to, even the ones who are pro standing up, cannot see how you can argue that Section 5123 gives any protection against the state's mandatory vaccination. It may, it, it may stop the Commonwealth doing it, but it doesn't stop the state. You know, there's no way it, it, it lets the state do it. So um, the state can do what they want, as I see it. Um, subject to this higher overarching human right. So this is why I said, this is why today I really wanted to cover this topic because you can't have, you know, a spiritual awakening or a political awakening without a spiritual awakening and you can't have a spiritual one that's going to last without a political awakening. That's my basic tenet here. Most of our laws and legal rights you see today came from spiritual awakenings. For example, a lot of the trial by jury and the Bill of Rights, which came into England and, and the Magna Carta, all were preceded by a very big spiritual awakening among the people, um, as well as a political one. The, especially the one with um, the trial by jury that came in, that came in because of William Penn standing his ground and against the fairly blatant law and arguing that there was a higher law or overarching right from Almighty God that governments couldn't limit people's freedom of speech and the judge was trying to hold against him but couldn't do so and in the because the jury would, would refuse to budge and that was how the trial by jury and not being influenced by the judge came about so let's go first down to why we're heading into civilization collapse now next week i'll go more into detail on this okay so when for the great reset and the financial reset which i really do recommend if you value your finances you come along to next week um that i'll be talking more about that so today is just a quick touching on this but this is a very good book heavy reading but goes through the um the, the realities of what we're transitioning into i mean it's such a good book like they, they pretty much talk about um the next 50 years they talk about a collapse and they talk about an inevitable collapse of the western world so an inevitable class of the western world carissa asks is this sunday no it's um sunday is one carissa but on the facebook group i do announce like 
like we did one Monday night, like an energy clearing on Perth. So they spelled out in depth exactly how it happened. Um, so what they're basically saying, and I will cover this more next week, is this. They said, when you get a society where you start to have more people getting paid from the system, like government officials, bankers, who really aren't producing in the economy, so to speak, and you've got more and more people expecting governments and others to take care of them and look after them and give them basically take care of their needs. And I mean, I've heard young people openly say that it's the government's job to take care of them. People seeing the lockdowns or it's their job to fix this up um, without really thinking where it comes from. When you have a society that stops wanting to work and produce, which we're seeing, and you have politicians become greedy and giving themselves pay rises like they are um, without really any productive um, influence in the economy. Um, when you've got like incredible deprivation of civil liberties happening as well. Um, when you've got basically the military almost becoming like a show rather than having any real force or strength. Um, when you've got people more concerned with pleasure, um, drunkenness, orgies, spending their money, um, whatever else, they said that that economy or civilization will always collapse and will fall apart. The Industrial Revolution saw a big falling apart because new technology came in and people resisted it. This is talking about here about an empire that's kind of run out of um, get out of jail free cards now. And what they predicted was this. They predicted that big global national governments like we see today are going to actually fall apart and be replaced by sovereign individuals and small sovereign communities. Now that to me, I always thought sounds good. In other words, in the same way that Aboriginals and American Indians live in tribes and they live in different groups, they predicted that the same would happen. That humanity would go back to what it used to do a long time ago, where more and more get people living in tribes. So for example, people who are dead, who are live in one culture, people who are more simple would might live somewhere else. And you can see, for example, I don't know if any of you gone to China or Hong Kong, but it's so different over there. Like it's like being in a different planet when you go to Hong Kong. The people are very different, um, you know, and if you go to China, it's different again, like different culture, different way of being. You go to America, it's very different to Australia. Um, if you go to New South Wales, it's very different to being in Perth. And I remember the first time I went to Sydney, I was in shock. Like I felt I, I just didn't like the city at all. And I still don't really that much. I don't mind, I didn't mind dropping in there occasionally, but I didn't really like it. Whereas I love say Byron Bay. The only other part of Australia I resonate with out of WA is the North of Queensland. And I do like Byron Bay and um, all that kind of area as well. So, but yeah, so there's basically plenty of, um, so the point they're saying is that big governments will start to collapse in favor of smaller governments and people getting fed up with being controlled by big global governments. But, you know, um, what they said before it happened was there would be a desperate cash grab by governments going bankrupt who no longer could fund. Because when a, when a government can no longer meet the high demands of its expenses, which right now you've got huge, and the problem that government's got one or two choices. Number one, to get up in America and say, hey, sorry guys, the economy's gonna collapse, stiff pickies, you know? We're spending more money than we're making. Either we've got to get more money come in or you guys got to sort out your own shit. Or imagine Scott Morrison saying that right now with his election coming up, it's kind of gonna be problematic for him. So that's why I believe he's giving money away this year, whereas he was kind of resisting it um, a bit before. So what happens is governments start giving money away. So rather than just kind of accept, but we've got to cut our expenses down, which means maybe let's fire, you know, 100,000 public servants tomorrow. I mean, yeah. So, and let's just fire all the government people that we don't need. Let's cut our expenses. Let's stop giving any government grants and handouts for the time being until we sort this out. Let's cut all welfare expenses and anyone who wants to, you know, apart from real disabled or genuine situations and anyone who wants to, get government support, has to give a clear case and has to go work for it. Now, no, governments, um, could you imagine a government doing that? There would be an outcry. They would be like almost like insurrection. So 
what happens instead? Well, they just keep printing money. They keep finding it. They just keep increasing taxes. They just keep grabbing it from anywhere. Exactly yeah. like what, um, you know, what Rome did, by the way. And Rob, Rob writes it here really beautifully. He says, civilizations get wealthy and implode under the weight of parasitism. Yeah, so people start to get complacent in their prosperity and mentally lazy. They start to believe that life will always be this way. People start to go, well, you know, I can fly wherever I want, which is what's been happening now. I mean, everyone here is used to a world where the last 30 or 40 years, you could just get the plane and go almost anywhere. You know, really quite a free time in history, relatively speaking, in that sense. And um, suddenly, of course, that right's taken away and people are going, you know, like going beside themselves and unable to adapt very, very easily to that. So governments, by and large, um, are holding on and trying to hold on to the way it's been. So even though the best thing the governments could do right now is to slash their expenses, that would be the wise and prudent thing, cut the expenses. Um, for example, what Peter Costello did in Australia in about 2006 and seven was he brought in special superannuation concessions, but he did so much good, uh, he and Howard with the economics, and that was why Australia went through the GFC virtually unscathed compared to everyone else, because it was exceptionally well managed economically. But now we've got the situation where what I call the woke cultures hit Australia, um, more and more people expecting the government or the business to provide. America is like tenfold what Australia is. And that's only got recipe for disaster. If I had a business right now that was spending, say, 100000 a month, and I was only making 80000 a month, I, I can't. the only way I can make that run is by borrowing money or taking from my savings. When my savings comes out, I borrow money. If banks stop lending me money, then I've got to either you know, cut my expenses or start stealing money from people or, or start becoming a criminal and robbing. And this is what starts to end up happening. So this is why governments, rather than just address the fact that the expenses way out perform their, their revenue or their income coming in or their money, they just go, okay, let's just, um, they start grabbing more taxes when they realize they can't get any more. They'll, um, they start printing money, which works for a time. America is starting to go into hyperinflation once it gets worse. Then, and they realize they're really in trouble. And when they should just give up at a time, they won't. Then they'll start just grabbing cash. And then eventually, as a sovereign individual predicts, they just throw all caution to the wind. And I truly believe the day will come when you will hear and you'll be glitching in astonishment, just like watching Trump get blatantly defrauded in the election in, in, right in front of the world media or watching um, governments just blatantly lock down over a virus and blatantly change figures and press conferences uh, just because they feel like it, you'll see the day when governments will just get up and take a whole lot of money from people, whether it's from the super fund or 20% of their super or somewhere else, and they'll just say, look, you got, we're all in this together. You've all heard that with the pandemic, haven't you? We're all in this together. So sorry, guys, you know, if you've got money, you've got to help out here. You know, we can't keep forking the bills as government and can't keep printing money anymore. You'll see that happen. In a really extreme scenario in parts of the world, you'll wake up one day and the government will say, we've just taken all the real estate um, over and we're going to sell a lot of it off and, you know, we'll let you know how this is going to work. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that starts happening. So I do think we've got some interesting days ahead of us. And the end result will be very good from all of this, but the holding on and the fight by governments to hold on to the old way of life and civilians, by the way, and I remember what Buddha once said. Buddha said the reason people suffer is they want things to remain as they once were. But in other words, they're attached. So most people are still living in the world as they believe they would like it to be. And that is why people have grief, because they don't really adapt to change. So it's like, you know, oh my gosh, two years ago I could fly, I can't now. And that's what we focus on. So people find it very hard to let go of the way things have been and accept things as they really are today. So someone said about hearing thoughts on cryptos and precious metals. You'll hear about that next week um, if you come to the Great Reset, but not today. Um, Rome was invaded by a keen, ruthless foe. So the US government is printing this money and they're doing more and more and just giving it away. And this is what eventually starts happening. People just run the heck and get out of there. So the wealthy start doing that. I am noticing a lot of financial questions coming through and I am going to say to you, Bring them next week because I'm not really going to be answering them today in the time we've got. So um, the reality is, if you go back to statistics, 
in figures since 1965, um, there was eight workers to every pensioner in 1965. In other words, there was plenty of producers and the pensioners were basically the people who had the right to earn their money, you know, sorry to, they'd done the hard yakka, they deserved their retirement and everyone was working fine. You've now got about three to one, they're saying in Australia um, at this time, or even 2.5 because of the pandemic, but about three to one. So there's a greater increase of pensioners people getting government handouts, it's increasing more and more. Now, in the business, if you start getting less people producing revenue and more staff, you've got to pay who don't produce revenue. Those of you who have business owners would know that you've got a problem. So this, this is the reason, by the way, why house prices are shooting up because, yeah, prices and money is being printed and various other things and investors are negative gearing. Okay. So we're definitely heading for a civilization collapse. There's no question about that. You know, no question that we are. And the only question is how will we navigate this successfully? I personally have a belief myself, very contrary, and some of you, my Facebook friends would know, but I write very kind of posts. I think people cannot work me out for their life. Um, but I believe, for example, many of the many, there are some in the elite who actually are coming from the right place. I think there's definitely some very dark people who are doing the wrong thing. But I've got on very good inside intelligence, which I get, there are some who are very concerned. They know this collapse is coming, but only economic meltdown. And they're actually trying, you know, to find ways to minimize the effect on the planet. Like, you know, minimize flying for fossil fuels. There are people who actually are doing it because they honestly truly believe that, you know, so there's, I think we're at a pretty perilous time. And one of the things I've learned, and I was taught when I was in the underground off the grid movement with very high level secret agents and others, is that most stuff that you see in the media isn't all lies. In other words, they said if it was all lies, it wouldn't work. So you usually find a lot of truth mixed with lies to confuse people. So what you're gonna find in this pandemic and what's going on, there is gonna be some truths in there somewhere, as well as some lies. So when people say to me the whole thing's a scam, I just say, I don't agree with you. I think there's a lot of scammy elements, but I think there was some truth in a few things that are happening. For example, do I believe there's a real problem, you know, with the virus? I think if not now, there will be. You know, when governments mutate and create virus and start letting them rip, well, yeah. If we haven't had them already, I think we will have them. That's my theory um, on that sort of stuff. That's why I'm very, very much about being sovereign in my health and taking care of my health. and done lots of education in that area. Uh, I do think we're heading for a real economic collapse and a civilization collapse. I do think we overuse fuels and other stuff and really show very little regard to our environment. I do, you know, I never used to, but when I've investigated, because these days I have a very open mind, I used to be a bit more dogmatic and I study everything and challenge my assumptions. And by the time I challenged my assumptions. I went from someone three years ago who had not said any of this to someone who changes his views on things. So we are heading for a collapse and many societies have collapsed and always the same reason. I mean, Babylon collapsed um, because a prosperous country, when you look at um, the civilization of Babylon, boy, that was prosperous, like incredible prosperity. The hanging walls of um, hanging gardens of Babylon is one of the seven wonders of the world by ne Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the ziggurat was a spiritual power center. They say this is what the Tower of Babel was built. It was after that. The, um, that's why you see these things as war memorials as on the side, you know, they're kind of power centers, occultic power centers. But um, in Babylon, you got, you had a very prosperous, very brutal, cruel civilization that prospered because it was very organized, very efficient and had a strong military army discipline. But it came to the point where they were just prosperous, they were living it up, they weren't listening to their warnings from their prophets anymore, <coughs> they were just living it up and they got invaded by the um, Darius the Mede, came and took over them, invaded them, killed off a lot of the kings, took them prisoners and took over and then the Persian Empire became great. Same deal, same story, got complacent, got caught up in corruption, <coughs> got caught up with high taxes, got caught up with more money than they can spend, <coughs> stopped being disciplined and bingo, they got taken over by Alexander the Great. And then Greece for a while ruled the world and then they ultimately got taken by the Roman Empire who 
came in and took over from the Greeks and became the most, um, there's an old saying, I don't know if any of you heard this, but Alexander the Great, the great leader who led Greece to become the world empire, there's a quote from him saying, Alexander wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. So well known for his um, goal for world dominion. The Roman Empire collapsed, as I've already told you why. Um, Israel, Jerusalem, back in um, 706 years before Christ, were taken over by Babylon. And when you read the Holy Bible in the books of Hosea, in the books of Isaiah, the books of Jeremiah, the books of Ezekiel, they were warned about what was going to happen to them. And when you read um, in the book of Judges, whenever, you, whenever um, the Israelites or the Hebrew communities got caught up with their, you know, they became complacent. They became financially really, um, you know, just like like caught, devoted to, to self indulgence, to pleasure. They became complacent. They stopped serving the higher work. Started mistreating people. It said before their captivity, the stuff they were doing was horrendous. Like they were known for their horrific violations of human rights. You know, King Manasseh especially. Um, taking away any kind of free speech, being tolerant with certain things and then killing people who said anything against the mainstream, um, getting into straight up occultic sacrifices, um, allowing, you know, these kind of um, Masonic power centers, you know? So, so, so many of this kind of stuff. So Israel eventually collapsed and was taken over. Um, Germany in 1923 will have a diabolical collapse. And what you're seeing there is hyperinflation. People are having to carry in like bundles and bundles of money just to buy um, a loaf of bread or buy food in a supermarket. But to just collapse and cancel the whole currency and start again. And Germany was a mess economically. That was one of the reasons Hitler got in because his platform was he wanted to um, take over, um, was he promised to deal with the banks and the economic system and drive the bankers out who'd ruined the system. So that was one of the reasons he got in. So Germany collapsed completely because it just started printing money to solve the problem and said, let's just give money. So when they were, their citizens were struggling after World War II, World, World War I, rather than you know, do economic initiatives, business initiatives, they just printed money and gave it away. It's one thing I have to commend, say, Mark McGowan in WA, um, is that there's been a lot of initiative works in regional and business community to encourage business development and things like that. And we see lots of it, even in my local community. You know, our local reps are very active with that kind of stuff. And I mean, he's obviously got other stuff he's doing, but that's one thing he's been doing very well, which is why right now in statistics financially, don't know if, how many of you know this, but WA um, at the last most recent calculations around June was the most prosperous um, economic um, region in the world. So quite interesting. So... And he's been very resistant to giving out lockdown handouts and been more doing other stuff. And yeah, look, I'm a, I personally am a big believer and I've got this idea in my head as an aside to go and see our local rep and see if there's some way we can set up a foundation or some kind of way where those who prosper through the pandemic in business and come through it fine can contribute. And then the businesses help the um, you know, other ones that are struggling and give them, you know, support and grants, you know, without even handouts, but some way to help them get in their feet. But anyway, that's just an idea that's floating around in my head at the moment. Um, Argentina um, was another one. Horrific crash, same kind of deal. Um, so Argentina was, um, they literally ran out of money. And as you can see there, when people can't eat, they lose their shit. And I mean, Sydney's protest on the weekend was probably a good example of that. Like, I mean, people were scared and understandably so, especially because the um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to when they're going to reopen again. And I just even reading the press conferences, I just shake my head and I'm like, they're just not giving any certainty at all. So people like certainty, they don't like uncertainty. And Argentina, its currency was ruined, it had collapsed. So people were just writing to get food, you know, and to, and to run around and actually, um, you know, basically to do that. So Venezuela is the most recent example that many of you may be aware of, where that was a very prosperous um, country. Um, Maduro won the election in 2014. If you're ever interested in, you know, looking into some interesting conspiracy tinfoil hat stuff, um, Maduro was a strong socialist and the evidence of the 
um, manipulation of the election is almost identical to what happened with Trump and Biden. The same kind of strange things happened where it was generally pretty clear Maduro had not won the election, um, but he did. And within four years, it was a basket case. And when I was in Panama in 2018, um, literally there were, you know, I was meeting Venezuelan girls saying, yeah, we've all fled, you know, to get money to our family, it's just ruined. But that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with. And then food, people, you know, lining up for food on for months and everything. And their economy is completely collapsed. So um, I would say as an aside, I'm pretty glad that I'm living in Australia because by and large, so far, we've managed our economy well enough that it should be days ever come and, you know, heaven forbid, it would, it, I, I do believe it's a, it's a way away and there's enough time for people to prepare before this happens because it's been overall very responsible economic management of the country. It looks like it's changing at the moment. It's starting to be on the verge of change from all the pressure, but we'll see. So um, the US, on the other hand, I think there's definitely some issues. Um, Rumours are some parts are running out of food because of the supply chains breakdown and the difficulty of, you know, stuff like that. So there's no doubt without really getting afraid, but in the same way I have car insurance, um, not because I expect to crash my car, but to, but because I just want to be wise. Um, having a bit of cash on the side, um, having, you know, a little, a little, a few food provisions and stores, having a few of that kind of stuff is always a wise thing becoming more self-sufficient. I'll talk about that next week. So um, in terms of um, some tips around that. But yeah, Venezuela got into a mess. So rest assured that civilizations collapse when there's corruption and when it gets kind of ignored. I was very, I, I, I really um, shook my head and was very sober with, with Trump's election because most of my friends almost didn't care. They were more like glad that the orange man was out of office. I actually had people saying it to me and I'm like, okay, this is the same thing that happened in Venezuela. I think we've got some problems. Many people say the answer is a protest or revolt. Keep in mind the truth of many of the revolts and revolutions. The peasants' revolt in the Middle Ages was where the peasants got fed up with the government doing the kind of crap that they've been doing today and they just revolted, they rioted. They, the people stood up and went against the government. And people often talk about this great revolt. What actually happened was many of the people died and they lost the revolt quite easily. There was never, they lost it quite easily. But as time went on, things improved anyway because new governments came in and things like that. But the Peasants' Revolt did not end well. The French Revolution, which people talk about, I remember someone on Facebook put, we need another French Revolution. And I put, really? I said, do you actually know what happened? The French Revolution was where people got fed up with the aristocrats living at the expense of the people and passing stupid laws. <laughs> Sound familiar? But mainly the aristocrats living it up. So they kind of rioted, got together, set up a, a gallows, brought in all the aristocrats and killed them off um, and executed them all. And people were cheering and all that. Then the next minute they all got, they, they wanted to, but once a crowd, a witch hunt starts and a mob hunt, People want blood, you know, they want, it's like the blood, the thirst for blood increases and they can't get enough. And then the next minute, the revolutionaries turn on each other. And a bit like today, where the woke revolutionaries and the conservative whites, let's go after the whites or let's go after these. And then they started turning and then one group of revolutionaries executed the other. And then um, some of the people got angry because they'd executed those other revolutionaries and they went and started killing the other revolutionaries. And the whole thing their team turned into a complete disaster. So the French Revolution is never a good idea. Um, UK protests, yeah, look, I mean, having numbers is better than people doing nothing. I'll certainly say that. Um, just be realistic about protests. That's what I say to people, be realistic about protests. Um, everything has a time and a place. And if it's important for someone, people ask me, I mean, I have a lot of people ask me, what's your view on it? I said, well, if people want to do that, by all means, you know, um, just keep in mind that you've got to be ready for it. In other words, I, is it possible that the government are taking names? Very likely. Uh, and all I say to people, as long as you're ready to pay the price and you know that's your path and you're willing to, you know, go through whatever it takes. I admire, I admire people who protest who are willing to pay the price. I will say that I admire them greatly. I, there's a Canadian pastor, I don't know if many of you saw him, but a guy who was, so, you know, Eastern European, he just went off his face when they tried to shut down his church and he wouldn't let them in. He just kicked them out. And he, 
he ended up getting arrested. But, you know, he never had, you know, any, um, you know, fear about taking on um, what was right for him. I've seen, so, you know, I've seen people who protest, but they really know what they're doing. They're ready for this. They've decided I'll pay whatever price. There was a pastor in Melbourne cost, um, from a revival place who protested and he's been locked up. He locked up for 20 days or something. But he, he basically said, I was willing to do this. Rodney Howard Brown in Florida did that and he ended up getting locked in jail. But because of the, his protests and other pastors, they made a difference. But I will emphasize in Florida, again, what I said, it confirms my theory or what I say, the spiritual awakening. The pastors in Florida got together and started protesting and they also prayed their women asses off, you know, for, for, for rights and freedom. And it worked. So many pro protests, as I said in the beginning, without spiritual and consciousness shifting, will just simply end up with people turning on each other. And I'm sure many of you have watched and have been, I mean, I am watching, there's more people turning on each other on these awake groups than they are otherwise, you know, like one group against another group. I have people, the, the, the only people who really insult me these days are generally people from awake movements because they, they listen to something I say. And I mean, I had someone this morning who's involved in some group, just like go really give it to me on my Facebook page and imply all kinds of stuff about me. And I just laughed, you know, I just unfriended him instantly, which I always do. But many of these people have got so caught up in their agenda and in the conspiracy of the whole thing, they stop seeing the balanced perspective. And these days, I, I mean, and to be completely frank with you, um, many of my friends are pro-vaxxers and I prefer hanging out with them and many of the others because I think many of the people who are against it, although I agree with their cause, I think, this, I think by and large, they're, they're even more intolerant than the pro-vaxxers, you know? That's been my observation. Like many of my friends are very pro-vaccine and I, I find that many of them are actually more reasonable. Like I was talking to my Pilates instructor who's, who's completely pro-vaccine and I, I mean, they can have an intelligent argument. I actually said to her, um, I said, well, even if you believe in vaccines like you do, I said, do you really think this current one's gonna protect against the Delta strain anyway? Because vaccines have to be changed every year. You know, you'd know it from your flu shots. And she actually said, yeah, I, I get what you're saying on that one. So, you know, I found I was actually able to have some reasonably intelligent arguments. So the point I'm making here is if you're going to be protesting, if you're going to stand your ground, the consciousness awakening is not just a spiritual, like God kind of connection, but learning to see all sides of the picture to understand where people are coming from. Because you can't change someone's mind just by running around yelling at them throwing, you know, flame throws at them. Like if somebody about to you, what do you want to do? Just, you want to, you want to get rid of them. You know, people will change their mind when you're given, when they're given a way from their view of the world to understand what's going on. So like politicians who are given a way to view from their way of understanding the world, what's going on. And as you'll see shortly, spiritual awakening has political awakenings. And generally you have to get key politicians or military involved. At some stage, the politicians have to be won over. And I believe that's possible. You know, I really do. You know, I, there are some very good politicians out there, like very good ones. Malcolm Roberts, Matt Canavan, um, Craig Kelly, Pauline Hanson. That's just a few. Um, I know in WA, a number of them, you know. Very, you've got some good politicians who are there and they don't like what's going on. And if they can be given some good, you know, help, we'll, 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 do some, we'll, we'll stand up. So... Most protests don't get anywhere because it's an excuse for rage and they don't have, they don't get accompanied by consciousness shift. The other issue with many protests as well is a pure statistical factor. Like I said to someone, you know, um, if you, um, if you, like London, for example, had over a million people, well, that's great. Just keep in mind that London and surrounding areas have a population of just over 10 million. So it's only really about 10% going, which isn't as much as people think. So, um, Ariel says, good politicians to WA. Oh, I know plenty. Don't worry. It's quite, we've got quite a few good ones over here. Um, one of my, you know, very good friends is a politician for the Liberal Party. Um, if any of you want a really novel way of protest, that Lady Godiva, um, her husband was, was, a, was a fairly tough lord on the people and she didn't like the way he was treating the people and the high taxes. And um, in the end, she... Um, she basically said, I'll make you a deal. I'll ride, I, he actually said, and she was known for being a very prude. So she basically said, I'll ride naked through the city if you lower the taxes. And he said, the day you do that, he said, I will do it. And so she rode naked through the whole city. 
And her husband was so astonished, he kept his word to her, cut the taxes and ease the laws. So that's not an idea for some of you ladies. Um, I was thinking of doing it, but I think Steve Plummer would have a stroke and get highly traumatized. So I don't think he'd ever recover from that, would you, Steve? So Yeah, no, that's uh, that's not happening, Warren. No, <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> you, you're, you're no Lady Godiva. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, maybe, Steve, you could go nude on a horse through um, Sunshine Coast. Yeah, I might do that one day. I've got to be able to ride a horse, though, right? You do. If any one of you want to ride a horse naked through Sydney or Melbourne, um, yeah, let me know. You might, who knows? Work for Lady Godiva. Um, <laughs> I, get attention. Yeah. I mean, the thing was, I, I will mention was that, um, yeah, Andrew is here. Yeah, You'd probably do it, Andrew, wouldn't you? Um, so, yeah, Lady Godiva, um, just to be clear, she was a high level person. And most great reformations have a spiritual component and a political, but you get a very key person involved. In other words, a really key um, person at a higher level starts to take on the course. Um, you have, for example, the Yeltsin protest or whatever. Um, I ride a horse naked, but I look like Lady Gulliver. Um, so Yeltsin and the Soviet coup. I don't know if any of you are around in the early 1990s when Gorbachev was the leader and the communists the coup to get him out. And Yeltsin and the people stood up and took back the city. I understand, though, that in that particular one, what Yeltsin did successfully was he won the army over. The military did not like what happened because they liked Gorbachev. He was popular. Um, the, the, some of the other key politicians in the country were not happy about it. So it wasn't just the people rioting, but even the military drove tanks into the city and surrounded the um, Parliament House, you know, and the Kremlin and the communist takeover was forced to concede. So to win a war like this, you've got to have the spiritual awakening and you've got to get the key people involved. And to do that, you've got to find a way to win them over. So, um, okay, history of spiritual awakenings next. Now, um, so the Protestant Reformation. So I'm just going to give a few here. This one happened in the 1500s and the Catholic Church, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Dark Ages and they were, and I, I've been a big, big fan of history. I study history in massive depth and I love history. And um, the, in the Dark Ages for about 800 years, it was pretty horrific for basically people in, in, in the cities. The Catholic Church were pretty brutal. If you didn't get in alignment with them, you could basically end up getting knocked off and or getting tortured, or the witch hunts, and everything like that. Um, I don't know who studied the history of the Dark Ages, but it's pretty it's pretty graphic. And the Protestant Reformation actually happened because um, the Martin Luther stood up and basically took a stand and put and many of the um, what's called this was called Protestants. They argued a different, um, you know. But the Catholic Church was wrong, and many stood up, and many of the kings and bishops and the government stood up with him and many of the people. So there was a major, major, major result that came about from that um, Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation is um, is, is quite a quite a great quite a great account. You know Martin Luther, um, and the result of it was was the Catholic Church fought back for a little bit, but they ultimately lost their power, and. They, they end up, um, yeah, look, and that brought about a major change. It brought about some freedoms in England, um, especially because England at that time was resisting and still had the, um, you know, Catholic Church very much kind of fighting the Protestants for the various wars through the 1500s to try and gain control again and do things like that. And one of the really great reformations that happened in England as a result um, of that and again, I don't know if any of you remember history, was what's called the Armada. So in, um, you know, 1588, um, the, basically, in 1588, the Armada, which was the Spanish fleet, the Pope basically joined up with um, King Philip to, from Spain to try and get England to come back in the line with the Catholic Church. And England was scared because the Armada were known to be one of the most powerful shipping fleet in the world. 
And when English people heard they were coming, it's a little bit like Australia. Imagine if you woke up and heard China was on their way um, with their guns and armies. You probably would be shitting yourself. Um, and I think even now people are kind of seeing a type of that with what's going on in the world. And that's why many are scared. They can see a foreign takeover happening right before their eyes. So the Amada, when they found this out, um, Elizabeth, the queen of that time, um, she knew what needed to be done because she knew they couldn't match this army. So quite an amazing, quite, quite a phenomenal um, story. But she, she called England to three days of prayer and fasting. So um, the whole of England, they took three days, what's called a solemn or sacred assembly, three days of prayer and fasting. And as she said, for the blessings of almighty God to help them basically give victory over their enemies and very much almost an old fashioned religious thing. And Elizabeth was probably one of my favorite monarchs. I, I was a huge fan of Elizabeth I. Um, she was known that very smart monarch, like the Catholics used to regularly put spies in there and she had a way of hunting them down. And then she'd lock them in the Tower of London and um, was very ruthless of her enemies. And she would pretty much, um, you know, she was a tough queen, but she knew when she was outmatched. So she basically got the people to pray and fast and they got the churches involved in everyone. And what actually happened was when the Amada came into Britain, it's well known as it entered the English Channel and Drake was going up with his um, ships and cannons to fight him. Um, a wind came out of nowhere and hit the Amada and the Amada, you know, was, was, was blown all over the place. And they were getting, and while they were getting all very confused and like really had no idea what they were doing, trying to get their ships right. Drake realized what happened and can't remember his exact words. I'm paraphrasing all the lines was like, you know, God's given us victory over our enemies. Let's go take these, you know, I'm using obviously my own words, but son of a bitches. And they basically, you know, took their ships out and started firing cannons and hitting the Amada everywhere and forced them to, to flee um, an absolute mess. And it was basically brought about a major, you know, reformation in England um, at that time or shift in that particular area. The Renaissance and the Magna Carta came about because of a great spiritual awakening that happened among the people. And the, the people basically starting to get fed up with um, the banking system and the politicians or the people at the time and what was going on in, in, in England in the late 1200s. And King Edward Longshanks, he, when he got in as a king, he basically arrested the bankers. He did, he killed a few of them off. He ordered a cleanup of the financial sector and England entered the Renaissance and it, and cathedrals and churches were built. People worked 23 hours um, or, or weeks in the year and England became very busy in prayer, in music, creative, doing paintings as people's creative pursuits started to come. So when you get a, a, a cleanup of a society, the consciousness always cleans up with it. Otherwise, you'll always go back. It's like people who win lotteries, but deep down still think the same. They'll, they'll blow the money within a year or two. So I'm interested in seeing a consciousness, spiritual shift as well as political in Australia, because that's what's going to last um, or in US. And I'm, I'm hope, hopefully a few of you are with me, but that's what's going to last, you know, a quick sudden win where everyone goes rights and runs at the government with pitchforks may have a temporarily caused them to back off. But ultimately, I want to see Australia clean up its whole culture and its rights and it's acknowledging the rights and giving a bill of rights for our country and for our citizens, you know. That's the kind of thing I'd like to see happen, and it's going to take a major shift. Anyone else? Anyone else think that way? Yeah, Jasmine's the same. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to see that. You know, a really decent bill of rights that we've really earned, not be, you know, because we've really stepped up and we've really finally, once and for all, created our own identity as a country, and we're no longer Britain's bitch. You know, like our current constitution, where we've got our own, you know, identity. So the English reformations and revivals had similar kind of um, things here as well. Um, John Newton, an example of the slave trade in England was known for its brutality in the 1700s, brutal. And John Newton he was a slave trader and used to be known for his cruelty. He had a very powerful religious encounter with Christ when he was um, at the worst of his treatment and he ended up completely like repenting, renouncing what he was doing and left the slave trade and freed all of his slaves. And he, 
he basically devoted, he became a pastor of a church and devoted his life to um, then working to help free the slave trade. And um, that's why, as an aside, that's why whenever you've got a strong church or religious movement of um, really good, healthy religion and church happening in a society where, you know, the leaders are leading the way in reform and consciousness reform, society will prosper. I've seen Australia have prosperous times when that was happening. And Newton was a prosperous, Newton was, was absolute, and many churches today are just self-interested, you know, um, organized twats, I'm sure many degree, just run by absolute, you know, self-interested, spiritually dead, ineffective people who are more interested in running, you know, economic, um, you know, little music business ventures rather than the kind of, you know, religions or movements that would actually change consciousness. The Hindus, like Krishna, brought such a change in the consciousness of India when he was around, when he came to the people. Um, Buddha was the same, but, you know, really brought a change in his consciousness to his people. Christ was the same with his people. Um, the Kriya yogis like Sri Yukechwa, Babaji, many of these guys brought a real change. So true religious reformers and teachers bring a change in consciousness and they also bring about political awakening as well. And some of the stuff is quite mind-blowingly inspiration, you know, when you actually understand that, you know, and what can actually happen when you have a really genuine, um, you know, consciousness awakening, you know, like a really genuine one. Um, things start to really change and people start to see, um, yeah, a, a change in society. People start to change in every area of their life. And so... This is what happened, like here, Newton became a pastor of a church and devoted his life to getting with the slave trade, but Newton was smart. He knew that going on a big protest would not work because people were absolutely prospering, you know. Um, you know, well, he knew that many prospered from basically the slave trade. So the problem that he had was many wanted the slave trade because they were making a lot of money out of it. So that was Newton's problem that he was dealing with. So Newton found an ally in a man called William Wilberforce. Wilberforce was a much liked politician of his day and Wilberforce was regarded, he was a smart man, he was a brilliant politician, a great speaker and he, he won Wilberforce over because Wilberforce was involved in his church and when he heard his story Wilberforce's heart was moved and he had, and it's quite an amazing story when you read about it, Wilberforce had a powerful spiritual experience with Christ and the first thing he said, and he was a rich man and a very successful politician, but he said to Newton, he came and, um, sorry, no, he had his experience privately in his own home without, um, but he came to see Newton in private. And he actually said to Newton, um, you know, pastor, he said, I've made my peace with God. He said, I'll do whatever it takes to, to serve my society now. He said, tell me what I must do. If I must renounce my wealth, if I must renounce my politics, I'll do it. I'll give up everything if that's what's needed to walk the spiritual path and, you know, let you be my pastor. He said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, and Newton said to him um, with a smile, he said, well, he said, you could do all that, but I have a better idea for you. And then he shared his vision to get rid of the slave trade. And Wilberforce promised him that no matter what it took, he would, he would abolish it. And for the coming years, Wilberforce, the next few years, fought his ass off to abolish the slave trade without much success at first got a lot of resistance but because of his um because Wilberforce was such a compelling well-liked politician he won many over and he started to get more and more support eventually the day came when Wilberforce um basically got the bill passed in the house of commons which is the england lower house and the slave trade was abolished and the day it happened is quite a quite a kind of story he um he abolished the um in the house of parliament he abolished the slave trade and he got on his horse and rode with as fast as he could because Newton was sick and dying at that time. And he wanted to get there and tell him he passed the bill. And he got to the house finally. And as he got there, the maid came out and just said to him, Mr. Wilberforce, I'm sorry to tell you that Mr. Newton passed away, you know, 10 minutes ago. And of course, Wilberforce started to cry, but he said, but he wanted you to know one thing before Wilberforce could say anything. He said, um, he said, I, he said he heard the news and he wants you to know, but thank you from all of his heart and he can pass in peace. So a bit of a good, a good little one there. Um, and, but it all came about because a pastor, a man who'd been in the horrors, stood up 
and one a politician over. Um, Booth was well known with the Salvation Army. Many of you see it as a charitable thing, but that actually was originally a powerful spiritual movement from a man who gave his life to basically save the poor and help England basically raise its consciousness. Um, one of the most, uh, uh, probably my most favorite awakening was the American Great Awakening in the 1800s. I've studied everything I could find about that. Um, I remember when I went to America with the Bible Belt, like still to this day, many the Americans got what's called the Bible Belt. You've got strong Christian religious areas all through the South of America. And a lot of that came about from extraordinary awakening that happened in the 1800s in America. And there was a particular man who I've studied almost every book and sermon of him. I could lay my hand on it. Many, many regard him in the, um, as one of the, one of the most phenomenal, um, you know, leaders of an awakening in modern times you'll ever see. He, um, he, cause it wasn't just the fact that he changed the consciousness of many people, but the ongoing success rate, generally many religious revivals uh, or awakenings were powerful experiences, but they never lasted. You know, they maybe, you know, they lasted for a time um, and then the people lost interest and gradually dropped off. But the effects of the American awakening, 80% of all the people that were profoundly impacted by Finney's work um, remained faithful to their beliefs and principles when, uh, when they studies right till his death. And one of the reasons was Finney was a big believer and he was very contrary to his day. In his day, the churches were, were like today. They were very slack when he, when he was involved. They were very dead. They were more caught up with money. They were more caught up with their own interests. And many of them used to teach that the church should stay out of politics. They would say that, you know, it's none of our business. And that churches should stay out of business, you know, that's none of our business. So by and large, the business world of the, at the time in America was as corrupt as anything. The courts were very corrupt. Freemasonry was ruling the American courts. Um, does it sound familiar? The governments were corrupt as heck. Um, the courts were virtually twisting justice um, like anything. And um, the slave trade was rife. And Finney um, used to always teach that the church should be, as, or religion should be structured. It should, it cannot just be words, but you must show in action, integrity, cleanness, and purity of heart in your actions and your way in business. He used to teach people in his church movements that he'd say, you know, you should go out and prosper and be the light of the world. In other words, prosper financially, be the best business people, be the most honest business people. He used to say, um, you know, go out in politics. And he used to openly say, you cannot claim to be a follower of Christ and be spiritual and sit there and allow political corruption to go unchecked. He would say that. And he used to challenge his churches and he used to have people, churches and cities would burn statues of him in public with their fury towards him because he would, because he would, he challenged the slave trade head on. He said in America, he said, um, it's, it's, a, it's a diabolical that, that people should be forcibly made to do slavery. And he stood up like mightily. Um, it'd be like a really big name church leader in Australia standing up against the vaccine and saying, this is outrageous, and I will not sit here and put up with this crap, you know? Um, that's, that's what it would be like. And what's very interesting is when I, you read his autobiography, and like I said, I've read just about every book of this guy I could lay my hands on in him. He tells a story with Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was pro-slavery, by the way, um, what many don't know. But he was pro-slavery for a long time. And... <clears throat> He used to write to him about wanting to meet with him to talk to him about how slavery had to be abolished. Lincoln didn't want to do it because he knew that slave slave trading, a lot of his electorate had voted for him because of the slave slavery. The South was very pro-slaves and many of the plantations in South Carolina and other places were very prosperous from the slaves. So Lincoln And Lincoln himself um, was involved in that as well. So the last thing that Finney wanted to do, or Lincoln wanted to do, but Finney ordered his church to pray and get active. And Finney wrote, not, actually tells, he wrote nine letters to Lincoln, never got answered. And then one day he was praying about the slavery issue in their church prayer meeting. And he got this inner intuition message telling him that if he wrote one more time, Lincoln would respond to him. And he did. And the moment he sent the letter, he had this sense that it was going to work. And within a matter of days, he got a reply letter from Lincoln asking him to meet to discuss the subject. And they did. And the result of it moved Lincoln so much. Lincoln said, I know this will probably cost me my life, but I will do it. And he took it on. And hence we see today what actually happened.
So keep in mind, we hear the history story, we don't hear the prelude that actually um, that led up to that. So, um, so basically, but he taught that you cannot be spirit, you cannot have a political awakening without a spiritual, but you cannot have a spiritual without a political. And he used to go and challenge courts and judges. He openly exposed Freemasonry. Um, many magistrates and judges, he would openly go and challenge them on their beliefs without fear. He'd go and sit down with them and say, what you're doing is corrupt and wrong. Are you really ready to face with your maker today? And many of the magistrates and courts changed their views. Many of them cleaned up their acts, got out of Freemasonry when he's around. I mean, you, like I said, many of you have never heard this, um, have you? Like who here is blown away by this? I mean, this is, this is why America, why the prohibition came in. The reason why alcohol um, at one stage was banned in American gambling was because in the, in, in the awakening, people lost interest. Um, the churches were so packed, the casinos went broke, the pubs went broke. They couldn't get any business in many of the cities because everyone just wanted to go to the churches, clean up their act, you know. Um, and they didn't. They lost interest in. They they lost complete interest in going to pubs. They lost interest in going to brothels. They lost interest in going to these other places because people got their, their acts cleaned up, you know. Um, you know, got absolutely yeah, exactly. It's profound, and people don't know the history because it's kept from them, and the churches don't teach it. I was fortunate to be in a church when I was a teenager that taught me this stuff, that taught me about the mark of the beast and about the microchip coming, about the cashless society, about the government's attempt to take over society and about the great awakening that would come as people stood up. You know, I was taught this like back in the eighties, a very good church. I was actually interestingly speaking to a friend in Sydney um, last year who just said to me, you know, I, I was, she was the same as me. She goes, I was in a brilliant church and I didn't even realize it. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I was taught all this, but I, kind of ignored it and she goes now i'm listening that was her words for me now i'm listening you know so yeah most people weren't taught this in church bar because the churches just want to teach you the silly shit that that but your ears want to hear so that they look good um and they can keep a little pulpit you know most churches do not wish to stand for truth like they used to you know um whereas the best the whereas the churches in the awakening were mighty you know, they were um, powerful. You know, like the church is only allowed to teach the book of Revelation. I, I was taught the book of Revelation. I studied all this. I had uh, an, uh, an uncle. So the Great Awakening was a phenomenal time in, in history. And it brought a political change because the churches said enough is enough. We will not tolerate what's going on in our community. In fact, Finney used to say, he said, if you claim to be spiritual and you don't feel the pain and the grief and the anguish when you see corruption, and people's rights being violated then basically you're hardened of heart and he would say and you know your afterlife he basically says don't rest any great stock in your afterlife um you know i mean towns he would go in completely cleaned up you know after he'd gone through them some of the stories just blow your mind i mean i i would i remember reading after his conversion when he was 29 when he had a when he had he had one of the most powerful encounter spiritual you'll ever have me almost read about in your life when he had and when he came back the power was so in his aura and his energy field that people were meeting him and getting uncomfortable and falling on their knees and starting to cry and not knowing why because there was such an impact that happened to him and i think the reason that i could relate to him so much was i had a similar thing happen to me i i was very skeptical in my teenage years and i had an experience so profound i i shared about it before in some other webinars i won't go into it today but it was so profound my skepticism had to melt i couldn't deny i was knocked over with such power i was out in a trance and my sister who was in there behind me got hit with electricity that came out of my body and, and almost threw it into a wall and people around everywhere saw it so that was my moment when i realized that i had a path to play in the world's awakening and messages i was given so a spiritual awakening and a political awakening and also, as I mentioned, Finney shared about a business awakening. In fact, he used to challenge his um, members of his church who were poor. He said, if you're poor, he said, you fail to grasp your child of God was one of his favorite things. Because he said, he said, have you, he said, could you honestly imagine the king of England or the queen of England letting her children be poor? I mean, even though Queen Elizabeth and Prince Harry and Meghan Markle fight, she certainly made sure they were looked after. So he said, how much more if you're a child of God would, would, 
you'd be looked after financially no matter what's going on in the world. So we said, you know, wake up, find your faith and go out and prosper in business. And that's what he used to teach his church members. And they would. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's great when you know this. And Lincoln, as I mentioned, had such a profound influence on slavery. You had the Welsh revival where they had 20 people in the church and within 10, two, two weeks they had 10,000 because these people got together and basically prayed for their area. And again, same deal, pubs shut down. Um, the led to change for a time, um, workplace laws, because people wanted to go to church during work. So they had to end up having rosters because the church was going 24 seven as people were going to pray for their region and their communities. The, um, yeah, another, another amazing one. The one more recent one happened in 1995 in Florida, Brownsville, Pensacola. Um, I still to this day, I listen to the music out of that. Some of that music that came out of that um, awakening in 1995 um, I is still to me some of my favorite music today. I mean, I listen to it and I just like, you know, go into a deep state. It's just some of the most obviously holy, sacred music I've heard in my life. And basically they got hit with this supernatural power in their church. They'd been praying and um, yeah, there was again a big cleanup in the area and people were cleaning up their lives everywhere. And I think 19,000 joined the church in six weeks. And again, most of you haven't heard this stuff, have you? Um, and yeah, there were people were seeing all kinds of stuff happening in the, um, you know, people getting healed and all kinds of stuff. I, I grew up in a church where I saw that. I saw people getting healed of cancer, people who'd had broken backs getting instantly healed. So I've seen a lot of this kind of stuff. So I know the power of what this can happen. And I've always though believed that, that any kind of spiritual awakening is pointless unless it leads to a change in consciousness and change to a betterment of society. And when you study the great teachers of religion, like Christ, like Buddha, like Krishna, um, like um, the Kriya Yogi, like many, like um, Joseph Smith and many of these others, every single one of them all taught the same thing. They all, um, they all said that that basically you have spiritual awakening to be a light to the world, shift the consciousness and improve the quality of your society and improve the way of life. Gandhi's, of course, a classic example of that. I mean, I, you know, I revere Gandhi when I read his life story. I, I, I was just blown away. In fact, many of the Indian great yogis used to say they revered Gandhi. Gandhi was just, he was put in prison a number of times for his beliefs, but a man who absolutely lived everything that he followed with Christ, you know? Um, he was a, Gandhi was a strong, you know, believer in, 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 in God, in, in, in this, in his own way and brought major reform to India, you know, brought major changes to India because of the purity of his heart and consciousness. So you start to get really good people who get hungry for spiritual awakening, uh, who also are willing to grow their education and their mind and make genuine political change and economic change in the quality and integrity of society, you can only imagine where Australia could go. You can just imagine, you know, it's it's inconceivable. I this is what I've always believed, you know, that that we can see in our country. And you know, even in some of my darkest hours, I haven't stopped believing. And I believe it more than ever with what I'm seeing now. I actually do. I right now I'm probably more confident than to ever, you know, what I'm seeing that this country is heading to a very good place. So Right now, we're going to have some challenges. And as long as we understand there's going to be some temporary challenges, you're okay with it. It's a little bit like when you know that you've been diagnosed with a serious illness. I remember two years ago when I had a serious back injury and I, I was genuinely scared. I was really scared. And I did ask and I, and I got the real truth of where I was at. And it was quite serious. But I was told you can fix this, but there's some things you're going to have to do. And I had to go on a very intensive rehabilitation path, a mixture of I went on a 10 day water fast I, I and, and prayer. I went through a very gradual, careful rehabilitation process. I did everything that I was told to do by experts that I could find and completely healed myself. But I was able to do it and I now I've got the best back I've ever had, you know? But, you know, so things like that. Well, when you say they're assassinated, well, I, there's going to be, there's, there's, we're in different days now, but all I can say, I don't have the slightest doubt we're on the crest of, of, of the greatest awakening we'll ever see. And that's, I don't have time to give all the evidence for that, but I've studied, like, like I said, I'm an evidence guy. 
I used to be a lawyer. I have to study that. All the evidence I've seen, I'm convinced we're heading into a golden age, but we've just got a while to get there. But I'm, I'm convinced we're heading into a major golden age. And all this right now is a shaking to shake up the shit and get society cleaned up, ready for a golden age. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Um, this is just one big clean out. And we're just going to make sure we're not one of the ones cleaned out. In other words, there's an old saying um, by the wisest king, King Solomon, ever walked the earth. He said, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, you know, but for the grace of God, that's me. You know, I might put a post on the City Awakening route this morning that some of you may have seen or yesterday, but about consciousness and about really cleaning it up. And while we're at where we're at today as a society, where how we've lost our moral compass as a society, how we've decayed. And that every society that ever lost its compass like this collapsed. You know, Solomon Gomorrah, um, which I, which some used to say is a fabled myth. I did some study, archaeological study, looked at different things, and they found like evidence. Jonathan Gray, you know, that society perished, and the ancient scrolls show that because the corruption got so great and it got so lazy in their prosperity. So that's where we're heading. And I, but what I'm watching in astonishment is how many people, the fact that 160 people could be here listening to what I'm saying here. There's no way in the heck. If I'd said this two years ago, I'd have 12 on here listening, maybe 20, you know? So you can't tell me there's a lot of shit happening. I mean, trials and difficulties and horrendous things can have their silver lining because they wake you up and you start to realize I've got to change the way I'm looking at things. So our current money system, as I mentioned, is saying that. Um, the elite, basically, lessons from history, um, the big thing I want to mention why I see it getting a lot worse, we're dealing with demographics of a population that still don't really get what's going on. Um, they're not used to the kind of changes that are happening. Um, yeah, Arena says many of Williams sacrificed their health and changed for travel or the footy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember when Perth had one of its lockdowns. Um, I remember seeing people all over Facebook celebrating wearing masks at the pub, and I actually said to my son, this summarizes everything that's fucked up with our society. It really is. I said, this picture summarizes how far we've lost our moral compass. I mean, this, I mean, rather than grieving and like in, in shock as to the fact that I cannot believe that we've got so low that we've just been locked down and we've lost our freedom. We've got one group of people running around going, wearing masks, celebrating at the pub. Another group of people running around wildly angry at the government, blaming them. But I don't see many people on their knees grieving and weeping. Like, how did we get this bad? What the fuck did we do wrong? I, I, I'm not saying this for any other reason, but I remember when the lockdown happened in February, I was shattered. I, I was sobbing um, because I was like, how did we get to this place? How did we get into this crap? You know, what's wrong with us? You know, where, where did we go so wrong? You know, how far did we fall from grace? I, I was, I was shattered, you know, how, how complacent have I been? You know, how lazy have I been in my spiritual path? You know, how completely karmically inept I've been. I was horrifically on myself, you know, and I had no qualms in, in giving myself an absolute hammering, you know. And yeah, people saying shattered about Sydney. Yeah, I'd be grieving. I, I'd be, I would be a mess if I was in Sydney about it. You know, I'd be, I would be seeing the purpose of it all. And all I'd be saying is let this be the wake up call for our city. If not, let it at least be my wake up call. That's what I'd be saying. I'd be saying, let this be my wake up call. I don't care for anyone else, but you know, um, you know, I have, I've clearly fallen short because I know that I just, that in our lives, we attract, we attract into our lives who we are. So yeah, like vaccines being given to 12 year olds. Like I was just in horror when I see masks on kids and I'm like, and parents just, I mean, I, I, I'm on forums and people saying, you know, my, my child's being told he has to wear a mask. I don't know what to do in school. The school is saying it. And I just want to cry because I'm like, how could you even be saying this? You know, how could you not be saying you can take your mask and shove it so far up your ass, it's going to get stuck and you'll never get the cloth out. You know, that's the kind of thing I, I would be saying, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, adults, I mean, we, we bought this on ourselves. That's how I see it. And it's just getting back to that deep, deep realization that we got to this state and we don't blame anyone else. We just go, right, let's just, you know, don't get over emotional. We feel the pain, we grieve the pure, true tears and then go, right, okay, now let's just 
turn this into action. Let's just turn this into, into action, you know? Because we've got that, we've got the supply chains, the importing reliance breaking down, you know, that's that's happening as well. Um, so that means that things are taking longer to get here, like in this whole breakdown in society. More and more people think tangible wealth and fictional illusions is the way, rather than gold, silver, food, things like that. You know, relationships, community, the things that count. That's what my Facebook ground page, many of you now notice how I'm openly sharing about my life. That's my way of opening myself to build connection with people. I want friends on my Facebook group who I know, who share their lives with me, I do, who talk to me on Messenger. I don't want people who, you know, read my messages and ignore it or we give these illusionary pictures on Facebook. I thought I'm not interested in that world anymore. That's just crap. That's a stupid world. And people who want that world can go and live it outside of my universe. You know, and moral order and ethics has changed. That we, we that goes without saying. Social media means there's just so much fear um, and awareness that can be built up in mind control so, so easily in people. That's why I see it as getting really, really challenging. Um, why will it go longer than people think? People do, People go into denial. I think most people are heavily in denial what's going on, you know? Um, just pretending it's not happening or going overkill. And this is why it's important as an aside to work out what's legitimate fear and what's not a legitimate fear. Like my opinion, is I'm not really fussed about mandatory vaccines. I'm just not. And there's a long reason I'd give that to you, which I don't have time to go too much into it. But in very simple summary, it goes something along the lines is that Australia is the arson of the world. We're already way behind because we, we got missed out a lot of our vaccines. By the time they've come in, there's a new strain anyway, and they're probably not working. And um, governments are gonna be pretty, pretty much trying to work this out for a long time to come. And by the time they've worked it all out and got everything in, most of the population will have seen all of the side effects anyway. So I'm not particularly um, fussed about it myself. I, I, I'm betting there's a contrarian. It's going to be nothing like, certainly where I live in WA, um, the, the issue that people think. In other states, could it be an issue? Look, I think the mental pressure is going to be very high. I think it'll be horrendous. But... It's a very big step for government to actually pin people down and force it into them. You know, um, it's um, it's gonna it takes a big step. And like anything, you know, it's a betting game, like a betting market. My bet is it's not going to go that far. I think there are bigger problems ahead. You know, I think that that's kind of like a thing that's missing the economic crisis and the cyber pandemic and the eventual microchipping plan and getting everyone into their phones and social credits. I think the other things that, that, that are more something that, you know, society is getting this wake up call through the vaccine is how I see it, to actually get moving, to awaken consciousness so this doesn't happen. That's how I see it in where we live. All my study of ancient scriptures and the revelation and the various books about this time is although it's inevitable that it's going to come into the earth, um, there's got, it's all, also shown there are parts of the world which don't get affected. So there's no reason why that can't be Australia, that will be parts that can't be affected, you know? And I think the biggest challenge with the vaccines will be mental pressure, like mental warfare. You're going to be hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered. That's why I hardly read the social media. If I do, I read it for a laugh, you know, to read about the lotteries and about the, you know, and I, as I, and I, as I said to someone the other day, I said, look, I said, they're at least going to have to offer me free passes to the strip club and, um, you know, a free plane trip, you know, to Europe or something on a private jet. And then, then I might consider it. It's my way of taking the piss out of people. But, you know, um, so, yeah, it's human nature to be in denial is the point I'm saying here. Um, it's the lag effect. It takes a fair while. Uh, the kind of things happened last year, but I think well, we're just starting to see now the lag effects in the economy. I see by about two or three years from now, the lag will be fully there. History lessons again. Things tend to go longer than you think. Um, as and many of you know, who've had shitty periods of your life, when it turns to shit, it tends to go for shit longer than you think it will go. Equally, when things get better, they tend to go longer than you think it will. And I'm sure you all know what I mean. Um, ancient prophecy, as I mentioned, says it will take a bit of work. When, when you're going through trauma and challenging time, time have actually proven in science, time slows down. Like who here from Sydney right now feels like it's never ending and time has just stopped? Is there anyone who 
you kind of feel like that right now. Like time has just stopped dead. Anyone kind of feeling like that right now? My guess is probably there will be a couple of you, is my guess. Okay, yep, there's a few. Groundhog Day, weird time. Yep, so there's quite a few. So, yeah. Extremes of duality, we've got a very polarized world right now. Um, you know, really polarized world. Um, extremes of duality, um, one way or the other, and the snowballing effect. When it gets worse, it just seems to get faster and faster until you arrest the snowball. So that's the key here. Consciousness is the only thing. I can, and the reason I'm so big on consciousness, just so you absolutely know, um, you know, that you absolutely know, this is not just a theory. This stuff I'm teaching you today changed my life. Like, I literally was an absolutely um i was a health mess if you met me 20 odd years ago i had severe rsi severe chronic fatigue severe fibromyalgia chronic depression um was in a job i didn't really like um i was um having constant you know ongoing gut issues and health issues and this issue and i had asthma on and off um I had a horrible, you know, you know, experiences with bullying over and over with my childhood and others. I had issues with my mom. I had my best friend had really, you know, let me down badly in my life um, at that time. So, yeah, I basically at that time, I really did want to pass over and get out of here. And the thing that got me turned around was, like I said, getting back to my spiritual foundation and the consciousness shift. And once I went on that path, I can honestly say these days, I can't really think of much wrong with my life. I'm prospering. I've got people in my life that love me. I've got great kids. My health is like, when I've been checked up on, there's really nothing wrong with me. Um, my, I don't, can't remember the last time I had a toxic thought or depression. I just honestly can't remember. It was that long ago. Um, you know, so you can absolutely transform your consciousness. And I can say that when what's going on around me, I'm people say to me, how are you coping with the world? I'm saying life's never been so better for me. You know, I'm getting on with my path. I'm seeing how, you know, that in all this happening the hand of God to wake up the consciousness and get our society ready for the golden age. So, and finally clean up our politics, which for years I've grieved. I mean, I spent the whole decade from 2000 and about eight to about 2017, arguing in courts and taking on governments because I, could see all this stuff that everyone's seeing now and it's just great to finally see it being addressed and being actioned so and why will it get better than people think new era of conscious business and change of industry i see that you're going to see a lot of cleanup in business come out of this i really do like people won't tolerate being swindled online and things like that um the, I, the opportunity right now for in business and investing i've never seen just good opportunity with I've made more money in the last 16 months than I've probably made in the last 10 years. You know, it's just been incredible investment, business opportunities like I've not seen before. More local community-based self-corporates, less corporate, small cities and regions will prosper. Oh, it's just great. The country towns, the regionals are growing, regional tourism is growing. Um, I'm getting this so much community. I've been a hermit for years and a bit of an introvert, and I've got all these friends in Perth now, Trudy Awake community, who I catch up with and randomly meet for coffee. Um, I'm growing our own vegetables. We just started, thanks to Mike Dastalak, who'll probably listen to this at some stage. Uh, yeah, there's more. Like, I'm, I'm, we're getting very community. I've noticed our local politician where we live is really involved in the community, is cleaning up asbestos, improving our parks. You know, there's a lot of things happening to clean up the consciousness. Um, WA have just passed laws to get rid of plastic cups and phase them out by 2023. And I'm like, wow, that's so good, you know? So it'll force me to have to carry a cup or bring something, but I'm like, that's or that's really good, you know? Stuff that's gonna protect the earth. Social media used correctly um, can make a difference. I'm already noticing people becoming more financially responsible, less entitled. Many, but I'm noticing are like shivers, you know? The days of just, hey, like three years ago, what's your dream? Hey, I want to get a private jet. Oh yeah, now I want to go to Vegas and do this. Oh yeah. 
now people are like, yeah, I just want to grow some veggies and build some better relationships with my family and really do God given purpose and maybe get, get on back to, to find a good church or spiritual community I can be part of or yeah, or just kind of, you know, show more love to my parents or let's just, um, you know, eat a bit less, learn to be a bit more responsible with my eating and let's maybe I don't need to go and spend money and buy all these little things. You know, people are becoming much more wiser with their money and simplifying their life and living simple lives. And it's so much better. I live a very simple life. I mean, I, I'm most excited about this camper trailer that we're going to be getting once the waiting list is up next year, you know, things like that. Um, simple life. I live near Woodman's Point where it's a main fishing area, um, right in the remote part of Perth, you know, living a lovely, simple life, new economic system. that's going to be more rewarding, you know, things like that. Um, and ancient prophecy, which said that these days would turn into a golden age. So really, really good. And so to finish off, before we take questions, um, why are we heading for the greatest awakening in modern history? Well, there's so many reasons that I've shared with you then. But yeah, look, basically, um, it's been just about every major spiritual teacher, prophet talked about this great awakening. Finney talked about it. When you read Charles Finney's teachings on, on, on revival lectures and things like that, he talked about the coming of a golden age that he said would be so great in the earth that um, he said that the sporadic ups and downs of, you know, emotional religion would come to an end and people would move more into a state of habitual obedience, cleaner consciousness and orderly living in society and greater honoring of their religious and spiritual festivals. Um, the create, basically, many of the Indian Kriya yogis talked about these days, where there'd be a cleanup of the consciousness, and, a, and they talked about the ending of the age of the Kali Yuga, is another way it's been talked about, to enter the new Kali, um, whatever it is, the Kali or whatever. The uh, age of, another have talked about it as the end of the age of Pisces, moving into the age of Aquarius. But many of the movements are all talking about this major shift that's happening and this is a particularly significant one in every almost spiritual major calendar you can find if you research into this. I have no doubt we're heading into something special. Um, and I just, all I can say is that if I had to give everyone the ultimate, you know, guidance, it's being part of spirit of community and getting action and being part of your part in the army of God. That's why we run our spiritual community with City Awakening. And that's why we run our Wednesday meetings like tonight. We've been running our Sunday meetings for spiritual consciousness awakening because I am truly convinced that building a powerful spiritual community in every city of the earth where the people are working together in community, they love, they love each other by action, not just by flowery, dumb words, but in a really practical action way, caring for each other, loving each other enough to be blunt with each other when they think each other's being an idiot and um, living their purpose without judging. Because the truth is not everyone can do what I'm doing and nor would you want to be. Not everyone can do what some of the amazing ones of you do who protest and will do anything for your work, you know. Um, some of you, just by raising your family, do not realise the life you can do. Grace would, would share openly how she spent many years just raising the boys and I think at times feeling a bit frustrated but she's doing nothing but now I'd be realising that the difference she's made in the world by spending those years giving our boys a strong foundation, you know. Um, because we used to be married once upon a time. Um, so everyone's got a place. And I think the greatest awakening comes when we start to build this community and, and learn the lessons of our forefathers in history. Learn the answer that protest definitely has its place, but it will have so much more power when you have conscious spiritual awakening happening, cleaning up of consciousness in society, people coming with orderly, carefully thought out strategies in how you're going to reach the politicians, how you're going to wake up the people rather than running their burning flags to burn down the place. You know, really orderly, well thought out thoughts and, str and strategy on how we're going to win the politicians over, how we're going to win people over, how we're going to win those people over who we never thought we could. So you're welcome to come on Sundays. Um, we've got a Telegram group, which Grace can give you the details of it. We've got our Facebook group. But, you know, you're welcome to come on Sundays. We're doing another one next week. We'll probably do one the week after that. Because, like I said, I'm passionate about that spiritual awakening and building a strong community and having everyone play their part. So, yeah, to say we need an awakening is an understatement and it requires, and it definitely 
requires action in the political. A spiritual awakening without political action and financial shifts really is just a clanging sound. Okay, so questions. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah, I'm seeing some great ones here. Ariel wants to know Global Wealth on Telegram. Yes, we are. It's always fun to get our Telegram link, but I'll do my best and see if I can get it um, to help you out. So let's see if I can find this for you. Um, oh yeah, I can do this now. So, so here we are. Um, I feel it's too late to understand finance. No, not at all. In fact, I would strongly recommend that you understand very quickly because otherwise um, you don't want to be in a position where you're hoping the government will look after you. So, Tony, I've only ever heard rumors of nefarious activities in the Masonic movement. How do we keep attracting new members? Yeah, look, you've got to understand the Masonic movement, um, that the front end is actually what is called the White Masons. They're very much humanitarian, giving back, do a lot of humanitarian works. You've got to go down to about the 18th degree onwards to get into the other side of it. So, you know, most people um, only in the Masonic, um, they've got this front. Like Many politicians join the Masonic Lodge because they see the, the giving back. And it's like a good um, movement or network to be involved in to give back to the community and get into politics. And then as it goes through, they find out what's really involved. And I know because I have a friend who was, a, who was as high as a 32nd degree Mason, which is really high. Um, and I'll, he, everything you read about the net, most of it he confirmed for me. And yet, yeah, once you get in there, he said it's very hard to get out of it, like very hard. So that's what happens for many of them. So Bridget asks, can we share this afterwards? Of course we can, no problem. Um, Carissa, talking about the microchipping, or is there anything now? Yeah, look, I'll be sharing about um, next week, we're talking about financial, but yeah, we talk about that sometimes on Sunday, Carissa, and if people are interested, I might do that as a week five or something. So I'm happy to do that if enough people want me to do that and how that works. There's plenty of evidence. Barry Smith in 1980 was teaching and showed evidence how in 1984 they'd already prepared the technology um, for the microchipping. So, and John McAfee actually showed the patent that Bill Gates, some of you may have seen last year, um, you know, registered um, 060606 in 2020, which was a cryptocurrency that could be injected into people. I don't know if anyone's seen that one, but um, it's 2020 060606. It's a cryptocurrency that can be injected into people as a microchip which then gives the ability to, you know, based on your thoughts, based on your senses, monitor your health, monitor your health symptoms, and even link eventual cryptocurrencies to you so that you can basically receive cryptos um, and it can be stored up in your um, computer system, which by and large means, and I confirm this with an IT guy, it means they'll be able to control your, you know, your meridians and your nervous system through a computer system somewhere else. So that's been patented now. So, um, yeah, so, Terry, do you have any plans for any gatherings in person for spiritual work or further discussions? You bet, Terry. Um, in fact, Jasmine would probably shoot me if I didn't mention this, but um, in a couple of weeks' time, two and a half weeks' time, we're going to be doing a, something in Perth. We're actually going to be putting on an event to see the interest um, over a weekend on the 14th and 15th of August. I think that's the date. If I'm not, Jasmine can correct me. But, yeah, but we're going to do that it's going to be a sovereign individual um event it'll be a mixture of teaching on sovereignty financially um and also teaching spiritual awakening it'll be two days get together there'll be lunch provided there'll be morning tea um it'll be real chance for me other awake really well educated i'll be there teaching um there'll be you know a couple of others there teaching as well it's going to be a paid event but we're keeping the cost you know limited to just basically make sure we're covering our you know um you know things like that so i don't know if anyone's interested in that but then we're aiming definitely from there to start doing more and more physical meetings because one of the things i'm realizing in perth is people are craving a physical connection place um online is great but they're craving physical connection um the churches are not particularly doing a good job so um if anyone's interested in that 
this type of Y here. Um, the idea of physical meetups in Perth um, and the idea of our event, just type a Y. Because I'll give Jasmine a good idea so she can be seeing it or whatever else. So Terry, yep, yeah, uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's a few people, great. So yeah, keep your eyes tuned for the events because we're gonna be putting it up. Yep, yeah, Lavinia, Martin, Fiona, in Sydney, that's okay. You can just fly over, <laughs> Ariel. Um, yeah, it's gonna be two days, but I mean, you can always come for one day or whatever. So some live in Queensland. Yeah, the one, by the way, before I forget, you can, we're going to we're gonna open that event up for live streaming as well. So those who live in Queensland, Sydney and, and Victoria will be able to attend the event through a live stream because we're going to set up a camera So because we've already had people keen to come to the event who are in, you know, that at Adelaide. Absolutely, you know. So, yep. So anyway, so just keep your eyes on the emails, on the Facebook group and things like that. So Ben's asking about the Join the Sunday Zoom meeting. Yeah, Steve Plummer's typing an answer for you. Um, someone's asking about Medicare immunization register. I honestly don't know enough about that to give a informed answer. Um, someone said the Australian Vaccination Risk Network has released a video um, stating about the federal government is gonna give the state governments our COVID vaccine statements for a passport. Here's a form. Um, that would stop it. Yeah, I have my hesitation if that will work because it's all very well to do that kind of stuff. But if that does get true, and I still have my reservations how successful that's going to be or how how easy that will get through in Australia. But um, yeah, effectively, if, if airlines are enforcing it, it's got nothing to do with government, which is what's happening in other parts of the world, I think it's going to be problematic. So I think the problem is not so much government on that, it's going to be businesses. Um, Justin, what do you cover in your free half hour consult? Yeah, I'll let someone else answer that. Um, Lynn, do you know about the Gazara and the Sara coming soon? I have, I think it's crap. Don't believe it for a minute. Um, as you know, I'm pretty honest. I looked into that and I think that's just completely made up. Um, don't believe it for a minute. If I'm wrong, well, I'll be happy to be proved to be, be wrong. I think that's complete nonsense. Um, Jody, what are your thoughts on Ricardo Bosi's approach? Never heard of him in my life, so I can't answer that one either. Um, so, yeah, Mary's inspiring. Thank you very much. Someone said, do you see any correlation between BLM, the growing awareness of Indigenous culture and our conscious awakening? Um, BLM, I don't really have much to do with it. I think everything has its part, but... Um, that, from what I have seen, is just a funded movement um, and it's caused more problems than it's solved. So I'm, I don't really have a lot of time for them myself. So I'm inspired Nate to ride naked under Perth and preach Jesus <laughs> to Macau. <McCallum. laughs> well, let me know if you do it. Um, um, Eva, I've enjoyed everyone on Wednesday night. There's something extra special about tonight. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed it. It seems to have been timely. Um, you haven't heard of Michael Tillinger, um, so I can't answer that. Do you think the centres will be dragged off to camps? Oh, I think, I think depending on which part of the world you live in, really, and how far you let it get to. I think if people don't awaken in their consciousness fast enough, and I don't, and there's enough awakening, I think, yeah, because I do think that the risk is if people see it as a duality, us against them, like you against this evil government. Um, the fact this duality creates resistance and polarity. So I think people who don't really take what's called self-responsibility and societal responsibility for the state they're in, I think, yeah. And you try and fight this thing without first doing a shift and being strategic about it and being balanced. Yeah, I think that could happen to them. Um, so... Okay, everyone. Well... Thank you very much for coming tonight it's two hours exactly so um next week we'll be doing our great financial reset and i really appreciate you coming along and listening it's such a, a pleasure and it gives me a lot of hope it actually makes me think you know what if this many people will come and listen and be inspired by this it tells me that you can do a lot with a, with a with hundred people even or 300 people awakening you can do a lot 
I mean, Black Lives Matters, Tash Peterson, Greta Thornburg have proven how small minorities, vegan protesters can make a big difference. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you all on Sunday, those who want to come Sunday and those who want to come next week. I'll see you then.